Thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to today's event being hosted by INREV and EPRA as part of European Retirement Week. My name is Andrea Carpenter. I'm Director of Diversity Talks Real Estate, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. I want to thank INREV and EPRA for organizing this event. I'm sure many of you will know the public affairs teams led by Jeff Rupp at INREV and Tobias Steinman at EPRA. Our topic today is real estate helping to meet Europe's pension needs. And we'll be looking at the role real estate investment plays in the provision of financial returns to support long-term institutional investment needs, while increasingly helping provide senior housing and other solutions for that demographic. Later in today's event, I'll be introducing a panel of real estate experts to share their insights. But first, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Brenner O'Rorty, Executive Director of RHL Solutions, to talk to us about how pension funds and insurers investments in real estate deliver long-term stable income streams that match, match their liabilities. Brenna, over to you. Thank you, Andrea, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, through this presentation this morning, I'd like to explain the importance of investments, of investments in real assets, specifically real estate and related social infrastructure to the long-term investment strategies of pension funds and insurance companies and their critical role in meeting their obligations, that is future payments to pensioners and policy holders. I will outline who, what and how of institutional investment in these real assets, um, the purpose of such income focused investments, sorry, next slide please within the portfolios of retirement plans, demonstrating how they enhance returns and lower risk through diversification. In the last section, I want to expand on the wider importance of this activity to pensioners and savers and to the wider economy and society, explaining how these investments are the bedrock of progressing a sustainable built environment that enables the development of a vital economy and progressive society, improving governance and the experience of all citizens, and how this activity is crucial to managing the pathway to net zero and achieving the 1.5 degree ceiling to global warming. Next slide, please. European institutional investors, including insurance companies and pension funds, have a 1.1 trillion exposure to real estate, which represents 4.7% of their 21 trillion total assets under management. Institutional real estate portfolios touch every aspect of how we live, work and play. Commercial real estate, comprises 70% of these portfolios, including the office, retail, and industrial, principally distribution and logistics, um, and a small, uh, sorry, and a tail of smaller but fast growing segments, including hotels, leisure, data centers, and life science parks. Similarly, healthcare representing real estate facilities, including hospitals, nursing homes, other specialist residential care and rehabilitation centers and medical clinics is a small but rapidly expanding segment. Residential accounts for 27% of portfolios and largely comprises social and affordable forms of bill to rent, as well as market rate bill to rent assets and student living accommodation. Residential has witnessed a four-fold increase in institutional allocations over the past decade and um, is a great example of how institutional investors analyze the interaction of wider structural trends such as urbanization, changing socio-demographics such as the aging society, smaller households, uh, later birth rates, increasing divorce rates, etc., to distill what the new real estate solutions that are required by the economy and society are. Next slide, please.
Real estate is a bulky, indivisible asset by its very nature. Institutional investors are seeking to have a market exposure to real estate, not to a specific asset. And so real estate portfolios need to have scale to be a basket of assets to dilute the risk exposure to the more unique attributes of any one specific property. It also requires specialist management expertise at an overarching level in terms of understanding market risks and regulations and investment structures, at a sector level to understand the business dynamics of, operate, of occupiers and operators working in, in these assets, and both at a country and city level to understand local market dynamics, local regulations and cultural influences. Institutional investors have a range of options for investing in real estate, and they can be categorized into the public and private markets, the listed and non-listed sectors. Listed and non-listed both provide investors with opportunities to pool their capital with other investors that enables them to more efficiently access real estate, achieve diversification benefits from it, and a veil of specialist management expertise. Institutional investors may also invest directly, but this is really only open to the very large institutions who have the scale, who have the ability to create the scale of portfolios and perhaps build an internal platform of management expertise. And equally, these investors for more specialist types of property and in new and evolving markets, will still access real estate through uh, pooled vehicles, whether they be listed or non-listed. Institutional investors choose their mode by their strategy. They are strategy led. And ultimately that dictates the mode of investing. Excuse me. <coughs> Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So why do institutional investors go to all that effort? What is the purpose of real estate investments to the overriding portfolio? Institutions invest in real estate for their defined benefit pension and life assurance policyholders. They have made a commitment to guarantee the future income of often predominantly public sector health and education workers. Real estate acts as a teaspoon of baking powder to the overall cake mix of bonds and equities that make up these defined benefit portfolios. So how is real estate baking soda or baking powder? Well, Real estate sits between bonds and equities on the risk return spectrum. For institutions, real estate acts like a proxy bond with investments in real estate being made to acquire a secure long-term income annuity. However, being a bulky indivisible asset, real estate carries a risk premium to bonds to reflect its lower transparency, liquidity and requirement for management expertise. Being priced to reflect these risks, institutions are attracted to real estate because all other things being equal, they can purchase their long-term income flow from real estate more cheaply than they can from bonds and achieve a higher relative return. This helps create a buffer, allowing the cake comprising future payments to policyholders to rise. The importance of this has been underlined during the low inflationary period of the previous decade that saw fixed income investments, especially government bonds, deliver low to no returns. At the same time as enhancing returns, it also lowers portfolio risk overall as it delivers strong diversification benefits to the portfolio. There is a low correlation between real estate and the other primary asset classes of bonds and equities. These characteristics make real assets very beneficial to insurance companies and pension funds.
If real estate is a crucial ingredient that helps institutions to meet their future obligations to policyholders, it also punches above its weight in meeting the needs of the wider economy and society, including the needs of the aging population. Overall, the real estate industry contributes 2.7% of the European economy to the European economy and some 4.2 million jobs. To give some scale, that's greater than the combined contribution of car manufacturing and telecommunications industries. But it's the role of real estate as an enabler, facilitator, and solutions provider of every aspect of work, rest, and play that brings color to those numbers. The co-location of compatible activities through the provision of suitable real estate amenities, shops, offices, warehouses, planned community spaces, homes, is the essence of place. And place is central to a sense of belonging. Around 35% of commercial real estate is held as an investment and leased to occupying businesses, retailers, and operators. This provides much needed agility for organizations, especially small and medium-sized enterprises, but also larger organizations. These organizations are able to align their real estate needs to what and where their business opportunities are. Being able to lease real estate means business accommodation remains a facilitator to growth, not a constraint. Better still, it also allows them to effectively pay for their occupational costs in installments, rather than paying years in advance by buying an asset outright and having what could be much needed working capital tied up in bricks and mortar. As well as leaving businesses to focus on what they do best, it ensures that the best people are focusing on real estate, which means that it's appropriately managed, upgraded, and now importantly, retrofitted. In turn, creating efficiencies for business, for the environment, and commonly increasingly increasing social inclusion. As I mentioned earlier, institutional real estate strategies are anchored to analysis of long-term structural trends to identify challenges and unmet needs in the economy and society that can be improved through innovative real estate solutions. Over the past decade, this greatly accelerated investment in a range of real estate solutions across the living sector, including many forms of housing, and healthcare. Taking nursing homes as an example, the activity of institutional investors has expanded the supply of much needed facilities, alleviating press public finances and increasing access to high quality facilities and care services. Institutional investors act as the real estate solutions partner to best in class operators, enabling them to expand within and across countries, ensuring quality, sustainable facilities are delivered that enable operational efficiency and importantly, enhance the experience and well being of the residents for whom it is home, essentially, institutionalizing what has traditionally been a mums and pops sector. Although as an investment, the institutions benefit from a secure long-term income stream for lease premises, developing trusted relationships with their operational occupiers with oversight of governance is crucial to good risk management. This raises the quality of service delivery and safeguarding of residents which in turn protects the investment itself. Next slide, please. It's clear through the example of care homes that um, institutional investors bring much more than their financial capital to the, to the table. However, their impact is even more ubiquitous than that. The scale, scope and longevity of institutions makes them unique in their role as universal investors, 
It's prudent for them to, to take a holistic long-term view in their strategic planning and decision-making, considering how one trend, opportunity, or decision might impact and ricochet across their portfolio and other areas. <coughs> this is particularly evident in sustainability. Institutional investors were early signatories to the UN principles of responsible investing and to the sustainable development goals set out in Agenda 2030 in 2015. Environmental, social and governance considerations are embedded in every aspect of the real estate investment process, from inception, beyond disposal, to repurposing of an asset beyond its anticipated lifespan. These requirements cascade not merely through their own organization, but to investment managers, service providers, and their wider supply chains. The built environment itself is responsible for 39% of total emissions in Europe, and the leadership of institutions is pivotal to its decarbonization. Institutions are demonstrating the importance of retrofitting existing assets wherever possible, rather than simply building new assets. With 12% of emissions embodied in the construction process itself, this reinvestment ensures the three R's of responsibility, recycle, repurpose, and repair, are used in preference to new construction. The maintenance and rejuvenation enables the built environment continually to continually evolve to remain fit for purpose and meet the changing needs of economy and society. It also facilitates a sustainable, progressive future for our cities and towns, all while providing security for pensioners and savers. Financially, of course, but also holistically to ensure the stability, sustainability and suitability of the economy, society, and environment that we will all retire into. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenna. Um, it was a fantastic overview. And I think from that, we can clearly see some of the direct and indirect benefits and how important that activity of institutional real estate investors is. But I just wonder what happens if they weren't there? Are there other kind of groups, other parties delivering these kind of same types of performance, same types of contributions? I think they're pivotal to, um, to achieving those effects for, I guess, three reasons. One is their universal mandate. Um, there are very few investors whose fiduciary duty actually requires them to consider the impact on, on the whole. And because of their scale, which goes across every aspect of the economy, they have to look at each moving part rather than focus on particularly one investment. And also they're looking very long-term, you know, they're looking 50, 70 years ahead. So that's one reason. The second is just the scale, their scale um, and their focus on income, that those long-term investments drive the real estate market. They're responsible for a third of invested real estate, but their influence goes way beyond that because most investments are shaped for their intention, attention. And I think in the industry, we'll often talk about institutional quality investments, whether they're for an institution or not. And lastly, I think many of the other investors, not all, but I think you'd see quite a skew towards the weight who are interested more in growth than income. That by its nature is more focused on cashing out over a very short term period and tends to be more myopically voted uh, focus on the asset than on what it's delivering around it. So I, I think they're crucial. Okay, thank you. We had a quick question and maybe you can take this one quickly as well before we move on to our panel. Someone just asked whether age-friendly principles for communities and cities are being incorporated into, into these builds. I guess that's from every aspect, design, usability, those sorts of things. Yes, yes, they are. And I, I think, um, you know, it goes... I, I think the institutions, as part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, inclusive, inclusivity is part of that, and that includes the aging population. It includes the fact that you know a, a huge uh, element of the workforce is and needs to be um, over fifties, not merely focused on on the younger generations as well. So those needs are being met, and I think 
if we look simply at um, building quality and building design, even um, access positioning of lighting, et cetera. And in the senior housing um, market, not for assisted living, and I don't mean assisted living and, and, um, and nursing care, but you're seeing very subtle designs that um, make assets very user-friendly to aging populations with, without them feeling institutional, you know, with lighting, et cetera, at the right heights and um, things, items at the right levels, print in the right sizes. Car manufacturers have been good at this for years. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Brenda. Um, yes, as someone put a question in the chat, please feel free to do that and we'll put that to our panel later or we can bring Brenda back um, for, for questions specifically for her as well. So Brenda, thank you so much. Now we're going to come on to our panel. We have, as you see on screen, we have three representatives from different parts of the real estate industry and the institutional investing base. We're going to ask each one of them to um, give us just a little bit intro about their, their company and what their real estate does for their organization as a part of a wider portfolio. So we've got uh, we've got Manuel Verma from BBK, Jerome from Alliance, and Jean-Pierre from Cofinimo. So Manuel, maybe I can ask you first whether you could tell us a little bit more about German Pension Fund BBK and the role that real estate plays in the wider portfolio for your organization. Sure, with pleasure. Um, so my name is Manuel. Um, I'm with BBK since uh, 2017. Um, and uh, I'm a sort of a, a youngster in BVK because BVK has a history of 200 years. So, um, you know, we are Germany's largest public pension fund uh, by far. Um, we have about 100 billion euros of assets under management. We are invested in each and every asset class except uh, maybe arts, uh, wine uh, and classic cars. Uh, and uh, real estate has always been a huge component of our portfolio, which uh, if you look at our organizational graph, real estate doesn't sit in within the alternatives um, part of our portfolio. It is part, it sits next to fixed income, general equities, and then comes real estate. And then after that comes sort of all alternative sectors like infrastructure and so forth. Um, yeah, I mean, all the reasons that Brenner touched on, um, certainly, you know, diversification in our portfolio, lower correlation, um, income, stable income return, capital growth, inflation hedge, um, impact investing, and doing um, certainly well uh, with uh, doing good um, and the other way around. <laughs> and, I, I, and I don't want to steal the thunder of, of my colleagues here, so I'd, I might pause here. OK, and we can save some for the discussion as well. Thank you, Manuel. Um, Jerome, maybe I can come to you next. Maybe you can give us a perspective from the insurance sector, you know, on real estate's contribution to overall investment strategy at Allianz. Yes, my, my pleasure to do so. Uh, and I, I would start to say I'm very appreciative about the, uh, the presentation we just had because it's very well put. Uh, that's exactly the way that we think about our real estate allocation at Allianz Real Estate. Um, Manuel also highlighted this, you know, um, I think it's important to understand real estate, it's an ecosystem, you know, it's a, um, it serves of our investment needs, and I'm going to discuss that, but at the same time, we're very mindful that we're part uh, of a wider community, um, and, you know, all of the projects in the end, you know, they involve the city planner, they involve architects, they involve the local communities, uh, that's really the, the social infrastructure of our countries that we are building via this investment. And we are very mindful of that. Huh? We, uh, we want to think ourselves as um, um, socially responsible investors. And that applies to all of our asset class at Alliance, but uh, even more, even more in real estate. So what do we have in real estate in our portfolio? We, we are one of the largest long-term holders of real estate. We have a portfolio of 90 billions so 19 billions across uh, all geographies, risk styles, and, and sector. That means we invest in office, in residential asset, in logistic asset, shopping center, care homes. It's it's really you know all of all of the real estate world is is somehow represented in our uh, in our portfolio. And the vast majority of that money uh, uh, is invested for our life insurance account. So what it means is that it's invested for the long-term savings of our clients 
for people just preparing their retirement, uh, in, to put it very simply. So it's high level of fiduciary duty, it's a long-term perspective, but it's also a focus on risk management, on quality. So the way we think about real estate is really about trying to preserve the, the quality and the, the capital value of our portfolio while generating an, an income and, and pre, uh, propose product, real estate product that makes sense for our customers or tenants, but to the wider community. So we have, uh, um, we take that long-term perspective and um, yes, again, uh, the conclusion is, is a way to prepare all the retirement plans and at the same time contribute to uh, a social infrastructure that we all use and we're all living in. Okay, Jerome, thank you very much. Um, Brenna mentioned sort of the listed, non-listed side of real estate and the listed side. And Jean-Pierre, maybe you're a, a CEO of Cofinimo. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how the listed sector fits into that wider real estate landscape for institutional investing. Very good. Thank you, Andrea. So maybe just a very brief introduction on Cofinimo. Uh, Cofinimo is a Belgian-based REIT. Uh, born 40 years ago, and what is quite unique uh, to this company is that it's one of the very few examples of internal transformation from an office-born company to a healthcare player, and we are one of the leaders on the European market. Pretty small compared to uh, BVK or Allianz, but uh, with a 6 billion euro listed company, uh, what we are offering basically uh, as a listed uh, real estate company is of course a steady dividend, which is attractive to uh, long cash flow investors, whether individual investors, pensioners, or institutional uh, investors, insurance companies, uh, pension fund. And of course, the main advantage of a listed company compared to a non-listed uh, vehicle is the liquidity. You can, uh, Cofinimo has 100% floating, which means that you can uh, enter in or exit uh, you know, whenever you want, still benefiting from all the advantage of the uh, international footprint. We are present in nine different European countries with, of course, a professional management taking care uh, of uh, this portfolio. In, in parallel, and I think that Brenna also highlighted this element, which is quite important, is that we see our mission also from a societal point of view, meaning that we can deploy a very large amount of capital to meet growing uh, needs of society. And as far as Cofinimo is concerned, is of course in the healthcare segment. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move now to have sort of a more of a round discussion about different aspects. So, uh, Jer uh, Jerome, I wonder if I can um, start with you. Uh, just thinking about real estate's focus on long term investing, do you, has that, do you think, changed in the last few years? And, you know, are we now better aligned with kind of what are essentially kind of policyholder and plan holders needs? Well, I, I, I think so, uh, because the, this I think the sector has become more institutional. If I compare real estate today, modern real estate today with what it was maybe 30 years ago, um, we have a much more stringent risk control. We have a much more stringent regulation, but that means also better transparency, better standards, better, um, better risk control in the end. So, uh, and by the way, I can thank INREF for playing a leading role in that, uh, in that Formation. Um, so for a company like Allianz, what does it do? You know, this more the institutionalization of real estate, um, it allows us to become more global, uh, to deploy your capital across uh, geographies and, and regions. Uh, today, we really have a, a, a very diversified, stable, robust portfolio. We have residential assets in Tokyo, and we have logistics assets in Dallas. So you know, it's very, it's a wide range, and that provides stability. Um, and and it's a, 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 despite the fact that the market that are heterogeneous and and really diverse, we achieve a high level of understanding of the valuation of our portfolio through this uh, institutionalization of the uh, of the asset class. Um, um, so I th I think that is that's becoming you know more and more a, 
institutional tool uh, in a proper diversified long-term portfolio. And you could see that the allocation has been increasing. Uh, so we, we started with a very small pocket of allocation to real estate a few years ago. And now we've grown to, uh, you know, you, you will see in many portfolio allocation reaching 10%. Uh, with us, it's uh, even, even higher than that. And I think it's here to stay. I think it is, it is, it is here to stay, this allocation to real estate, especially uh, given you know, some of the characteristics uh, of this asset class that has been described uh, before. And one important change, but I think we'll discuss even more about that in, uh, in, in a few minutes, is the ESG trend. So I don't want to say too much about it now because we will rediscuss, but this is uh, this is really something important uh, that is happening in, in real estate. This has started already a few years ago, but we really feel that acceleration, that the industry is moving towards uh, net zero emission. Uh, really, to, to really, we're all really trying to make real estate better. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jean, uh, Jean-Pierre, maybe I can actually throw that question to you as well in terms of that longer term perspective from the listed sector. We know the listed sector is obviously a daily trading um, a part of the market, but do you see them players actually taking a much longer term view in terms of their stewardship and their kind of ownership of real estate? Well, in terms of investors, I think, uh, you know, there is a high volatility. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, a, a portion of the investor getting in and out. Mm. Uh, but the long cash flow investor, more uh, insurance company pension fund, tends to be indeed there and stay as long as al aligned with the strategy. And of course, uh, you know, being the healthcare segment, there are not many companies like us which offer an exposure uh, on several countries in the healthcare industry, not only uh, senior living at home. So uh, clearly, uh, there are not many shops where they can stop. So which, of course, favor the long-term uh, nature uh, of their investment. And um, Manuel, maybe I can turn to you now to talk about some of the demographic mega trends that we're facing as an industry. I think it's very interesting that a lot of our growth is being driven by change in demographics at the moment. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about some of those mega trends and particularly those that support the older demographic that we're here to talk about in retirement week this week. Yeah, no, sure. So, and, and maybe before I do that, one, one spontaneous idea that might be helpful for the audience is also that, you know, investors have been investing in real estate when we had no rates, right? When we had low to no rate environment. Now people are staying invested in real estate because we have inflation protection. So it is really an asset class that brings a lot of positives, especially for long-term investors um, like ours. And if we think of being long-term investors, we need to look at long-term trends. And one of the longest term trends hopefully until everybody you know, is, is alive, is demographics, right? Uh, demographics, sort of societal changes in, in, the, in the cohorts, age cohorts of a society, which means sort of um, the need for housing, the need for medical office, the need for life science office, where all these uh, medicines and, and, and everything we've seen in COVID and in the pandemic you know, are invented and created. Um, and then certainly retirement living, um, and the people are getting older, um, so and, and it means that people are also changing in terms of what they do in their lives. Everything gets seems to be postponed later. When I think of my parents, at my age, they already had three kids. Um, <laughs> so it is, it is different. Um, so those changes within a society get reflected in, in the built environment. And we as long-term investors are part of providing those spaces so that societies can live and, and, and have room and spaces to um, fulfill their lives. Um, so and it, it is a defined need and that's something we can, we're can we here to provide for. Yeah, and I think that's what Brenda talked about, that dual need of financial performance for the uh, income yeah. for, um, for um, pen pension funds and insurance companies, but also the contribution they're making in terms of society and this the aging demographic that we know we have. So why don't we dig a bit deeper into that? And um, uh, Jean-Pierre, I mean, your organization yes. um, focuses a lot on the senior living sector. Can you tell yes. us 
the prospects for that and really what's happening in that area at the moment and how it's evolving into a very sophisticated part of the market. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot happening uh, for the time being. First, you know, as a, a footnote, at Coffinimo, we are not only in senior living, we are in the full spectrum of the healthcare industry, including mm -hmm. acute care, primary care, and, and so on. So um, your question is about the senior living sector and, and the challenge are multiple, but let me maybe focus on, on one, which is quite important because it relates to the customers, which are the elderly people. And I would like to talk about loneliness to illustrate our role. You know that loneliness is probably the biggest challenge that elderly people face, whether they are at home or whether they are in a nursing home. So the question is how we are institutional investors, can we tackle this issue uh, in a professional healthcare environment to uh, offer them uh, a, a more comfortable environment with uh, less loneliness that uh, compare of uh, staying at home. And this perspective, we are financing large innovative project consisting of a healthcare campus aiming at creating traffic around the healthcare site, meaning that families, uh, when they take the time to visit their parent can also benefit from other healthcare services on the same side, like GP offices, uh, psychologists, daycare uh, center, polyclinic, and, and so on. And of course, these innovative projects contribute to the sustainability of our financial return. There are other examples, uh, you know, uh, we'll talk about ESG, but uh, the sustainable character of our care facilities is indeed something which is important today. I can tell you five years ago, many operators were doubting about the need to have a, a green building for a nursing home. Today, the families are putting pressure and it's becoming more and more uh, an important uh, decision criteria. So we can also leverage on our ESG perspective together. And maybe a, a last example, to also increase the sustainability of our financial return, we tend to cross-fertilize the best practice among the various operators. We are in nine countries, so we organize exchange between these operators to make sure that we can anticipate better the need of the resident and, and the direction of the evolution of uh, healthcare as an industry uh, in Europe. And Jean-Pierre, just to follow up on that, I think it's maybe interesting for the audience to be aware that actually as an industry, we're becoming much more operational around the assets that we have. You know, it's not just about you providing the the actual buildings for senior living you're involved in the opera you know dealing with the operating partner and making sure that that's a business that drives financial performance and supports the needs of the population yes well you know it's uh as you know especially with the COVID crisis uh there is a lot of pressure on the industry uh itself mm -hmm. so uh nowadays you cannot invest in a silo in the healthcare segment you need to understand the network of this healthcare uh, industry on a regional basis to make sure that you can offer to the operators the best infrastructure, not only today, but being a long-term investor also in 20 years from now. So for example, if I take hospital, there is already pressure everywhere in Europe that hospital reduce the number of beds because it's cost a fortune to society. So being an investor in the acute care, you need to make sure that you invest in the right asset and that you will not end up with a product that will just become obsolete in 10 years from now because the yeah. capacity of bet is completely disproportionate to the needs. Okay. And uh, Manuel, another sector, you mentioned it in your briefly in your opening, which is life sciences, which is a, a really exciting part of the market for real estate at the moment. It's something that's developing as a new product out of this kind of ecosystem of research and universities and you know advances in med medicine. Can you tell us a little bit more about the positive impact that will have on the older, older demographic and how it's emerging as an opportunity for institutional investors? Yeah, no, totally. It's a, it's a very important topic. So the thing is, the way we as BBK learned about life science offices is um, sort of the beauty that we are investing both in private, sort of unlisted, but also in listed. So, um, the listed world has known life science offices um, for a much longer period of time, especially in the US. Um, 
whereas the private market hasn't really looked at it as much or it wasn't as prominently discussed. Um, mm -hmm. Through the pandemic, that changed dramatically. Um, even before uh, one of the largest uh, investor managers with a capital B um, has delisted actually um, a health, uh, a life science office REIT in the US, put it private and put it now in a long-term investing vehicle in which um, you know, uh, our peers are also invested in. So I think the, the interesting piece is that if, if, if you're having both angles listed and non-listed, you, uh, you have a more holistic understanding of the market. And so what it means is that running into the pandemic, we already had an understanding of what that sub-asset class of office or medical office is in a way, um, and have seen and appreciated all the positives to also invest on the private side into that asset class. And what it means is that, you know, when people and pharmaceutical companies are signing up a lease and they're building a laboratory um, interior in the spaces and the premises, it means they don't, they don't do this like for three years or five years, right? They, they're doing this for 15 years, maybe 20 years. So it means you have again an alignment of interest. So we need, um, you know, long-term cash flow. They are signing a long-term lease, ideally inflation indexed. Um, so it means that um, we get an alignment of interest again on, on, on that topic as well, similar to senior living or, or other topics that we discussed. I think that's certainly something that is uh, very important next to certainly, um, again, providing space for a societal need sort of for research and development um, in, in those fields. Um, and does yeah. it provide you with something different for, from a financial return perspective than maybe other sectors, maybe just that combination of the yeah, ecosystem? I think, I think certainly we have seen, you know, when all of us, we went working from home, those labs, they continued to um to you know operate the the buildings so they you can't move a laboratory to your living room so it means this is it is a very defensive sub asset class mm -hmm. which also means it's a very sticky tenant um who invests in uh, who are investing you know in their spaces with their own capital building out those those spaces so it means it is a sticky income it's a sticky tenant it's a long-term income again what we need um, but sort of we, we're not the only ones out there who have understood this. So it's also a very competitive market. Um, but it certainly sort of ticks the boxes of diversification again, long-term safe income, and less correlated to say, you know, a co-working space um, that has been deserted, you know, day one when the pandemic hit. But I think it's also interesting to hear from both of you so far about how many different ways there are in to this asset class with the different yeah. sectors and the different right. ability to support a diversified financial return. And another sector, Jerome, is the affordable housing as well. And sorry, the focus on housing, not just affordable. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that kind of, you know, how is that attracting more institutional investment at the moment? And, you know, does that have a knock on effect in helping the aging population? Well, I think it. Uh... Yes, there is a, a trend towards more institutional investment to the residential segment. Um, yeah, I think during the pandemic, we were all reminded that uh, the residential sector is actually very resilient. Uh, if there is one thing that all true is that we need a place to live, we need a roof above, above our head. But um, so that, that's the fund, that is the fundamental, but that's one of the few things that remain true because the landscape is changing. The landscape has been changing uh, continuously over the last centuries, which is, you know, we have the urbanization trend. So it means that just population continues to aggregate towards key city centers. Um, the, at the same time, the household uh, size is decreasing. So that's one, one factor of the aging population, by the way. Um, and that means that the, the, today, the, the real estate that we have is not always fit for purpose. And plainly said, we don't have enough. We just don't have enough residential assets where we need them to be. Uh, and even less ESG compliant residential assets. So here, the, the need for capital to transform the real estate that we already have uh, to improve the CO2 efficiency, but to really just to build the real estate that people need is, uh, is colossal. So I think here we will need uh, this uh, institutional capital to serve society and 
and to address uh, really to address that gap. And that's really uh, fundamental also for the aging population. I think Jean Pierre talked about it. He's talked about senior living. Um, and, you know, senior living, I think what was interesting is that it's very diverse. Huh? You have, um, you could have co living concept. You know, the, the, at the moment, the sector is full of new ideas. Huh? You have mm -hmm. a soft senior living, some residential for active senior. You have really the care homes. Uh, you know, you, you really have a, a full scope of service where we are really trying to think as an industry, okay, what is the best service that we can, uh, meaning the best, the best asset, the best concept that are sustainable on the long term and that will solve the population needs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, that creates also investment opportunities that will support, um, uh, you know, our liabilities uh, and, and, and our... Um, and, and ba basically, our, uh, our customer preparing their retirement. Yeah. So it's just, just like, go on, go on. No, but you know, I, I think what, what, I, what I hear, you know, listening to Jean-Pierre, listening to Manuel, is that, you know, I try to make the point that it's an ecosystem, uh, real estate. You know, listening to Jean-Pierre, you hear, huh? he has to understand the, the living population, where are older people going, where are they? He needs to understand the operators, he needs to understand um, the uh, hospitals need, he needs to understand so many, so many things. Huh? What, what are the family needs? What are the, to try to really provide the best possible solution. Uh, Manuel does the same with life science and the laboratory and, you know, who are these people? What do they need? How do they behave? In the residential, we ask the same questions. Who are they? What is the size of the family? Uh, what are the needs? What are the people need for interaction? How does the uh, and residential set interfere with society? We don't want to have isolated, uh, you know, social housing on the side uh, that's not connected to the city. It's a lot of questions, you know, we have to ask ourselves to really propose good solutions. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting from, from a broader point of view of real estate investing. I think institutional investors in maybe Germany and the Netherlands have been doing it for a long time, but you're seeing a much bigger proportion of institutional investors look at residential. I wonder if that's a response to that mega trend and that ability for long-term capital to step in when there are these major structural issues that we have with how our societies are working. Yes. Yes. On, look, on our side, what we what we like as um, institutional investors, as Alliance, being really a bit, a bit conservative and really balanced in our approach, is the uh, residential sector, which is uh, quite regulated. Yeah. Just to avoid bad surprise that everyone understands the rules of the game. Everyone has uh, the right expectation. Uh, so, you know, to try to find the right balance of how we behave with our tenant and offer a, a service over the, over, over the long term. And at the same time, being able to predict a reasonable return uh, and find, find, uh, find the right balance. Okay, perfect. And Jean-Pierre, one thing about all these mega trends is that it requires scale. You know, you can't just be doing very kind of small projects in this way um, to kind of to address this issue at kind of at scale. I wonder if, is institutional investors in real estate able to meet that challenge in terms of doing, you know, really kind of addressing these issues in quite a grand way and scale? Yeah. Well, indeed, you know, when you look at the picture of the demographic, uh, there is one point which is unanimously uh, stressed by the various studies is that the population of people uh, age 80 and more will double between today and 2050 which is of course in terms of demand good for your investment, but which is also a bit scary uh, when you look at the uh, current status of many of the stocks in the various countries, which are either obsolete, need refurbishment, and there is also a huge lack of infrastructure. And that's why indeed uh, there is a crucial need for institutional investor to deploy large amount of capital to raise uh, new capital and again uh, deploy. And I think it's uh, one of uh, the role of uh, you know, the, the listed and non-listed uh, investors together, make sure that we can meet those needs. But let's mm -hmm. not forget, we also need the partnership of the public authorities of the government to continue to finance the healthcare sector. And I think this COVID crisis has highlighted again the need of uh, the various uh, government uh, support. So it will be a combination of uh, private and public funding 
that we allow uh, all of us to meet this uh, urgent demand. Yeah, I think it's that's a really important point. That public sector interaction is something that I think the industry is trying to always strive to improve in that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I find the topic today is something we, we're talking about a huge amount, such an urgent issue, which is the environmental um, climate change issues around real estate. As Brenna pointed out, 39% of um, carbon emissions globally are from the built environment. Manuel, how is that being prioritised and addressed in your organisation in terms of trying to decarbonise assets and bring stuff to net zero? Yeah, um, so before I go there, I have one last point to make for, to, for the, um, you know, the topic we discussed just right before. Yeah. So, because that's something that I'm, that I'm, you know, underlining all the time to make, give a broader understanding of the use of unlisted funds and, and listed REITs, for example, to be investable, um, you know, vehicles to different investor sizes, because groups like Allianz and us, you know, we, we have large investment teams who are putting the capital out globally. Um, but if you compare like smaller pension funds with maybe one or two people covering the entire assets under management, maybe a couple of billions, they cannot afford to have like 15 or 30 people, um, you know, managing assets around the globe. Um, so they are, they are depending on commingled investing or pooled investing vehicles. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's something that I'm, you know, I'm a huge advocate in putting this out because the, it is it is extremely useful to small investors to have those investing products, um, but decarbonization is you know and ESG in more in general you know it's as with everybody else as well, um, but us as a public authority maybe even more you know it's top of the agenda. So we we joined the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, which means um, you know we have to uh, fulfill certain criteria at certain points in time. So there are milestones and homework we need to do sort of to decarbonize our portfolio. Um, we are using um, different services to do that. We uh, have a uh, sustainability ranking and rating for our uh, all of our um, investment funds um, and all of our separate account mandates. So mandates where we are invested our um, only us ourselves. Um, and we are working, you know, also with our peers and um, discussing sort of best effort and best practices um, with with our peers um, because we can learn. And the industry has done a dramatic change and a great job in the last ten years. Yeah, um, certainly needs to be a coordinated action, I think, on climate change. But yeah. Gerard, you mentioned it in your opening remarks as well, and I, I think it's. It is about doing the right thing to do, but it is about also financial resilience for. Um, you know, insurers and pension funds, right? Jerome, that was for you. Ah, so sorry. <laughs> yes. No, yes, and you know, it, it's been uh, our conviction since uh, already more than a decade ago that we, we want to buy um, and we want to, to build what we call asset-proofed, uh, future-proofed asset. Yeah. Uh, and that means more often than not, that means also very energy efficient assets. Uh, now that translates into new categories. Now we have a lot of ratings. We have measures for CO2 efficiency. So the framework has evolved and is becoming more and more um, uh, granular and, and, and detailed. Uh, though we have better orientation, industry standards are developing. Um, but we have, uh, you know, uh, we, we feel our position as a uh, industry leader. Uh, that's what also was said at the presentation at the beginning is that we're not the whole market, but we can set the tone because we are long term investors. We are the people who are actually buying, you know, the end product that the product that construction companies develop so we can tell them what we want. And what we told them is, look, from now on, we told them that a few years ago already, but from now on, we're only going to buy energy efficient assets. So it's no point de developing anything else. You have to be energy efficient and that has an impact. Uh, and we're not the only organization doing that. Uh, and you can really see the market moving in that direction and getting better at, at proposing real estate, which is uh, more energy efficient. Um, you know, the, the Alliance as a whole is uh, committed to net zero in uh, real estate, that means we're also committed to net zero. So we want to have a, a carbon neutral portfolio, so a carbon uh, 
zero emission by 2050, uh, but short term by 2025. So that's three years from now, that's really short term. We want to decrease by 25%. And we are today uh, almost 23, we are almost there. So it gives you an idea of the scale of the efforts we are making to decarbonize our portfolio. Also, as um, uh, in our position uh, as an industry leader, we partner with development companies who are investigating way of constructing real estate in a, you know, uh, with less carbon emission. So we have the CLT construction, cross laminated timber, uh, so wood construction to make it simple. Uh, we have also uh, usage of recycled materials in our constructions. We have concrete with better CO2 efficiency. So this is also the type of projects that we are uh, also supporting with our capital to, to help the industry move uh, towards you know, a sustainability goal. Okay. And, and, and John Pierre, just quickly on that, as I assume it's the same with you and the cust com um, companies in the listed sector. But again, it requires long term vision because it's a long term investment. So really, yeah. the type of capital we're looking for is institutional capital again. Yes, but it also requires short term goals, like Jerome uh, said, uh, you know, at Cofimo, we also have a short term goal 2030, the second phase of a project. So we are working on it. But we have also to, uh, I think, accept that for the time being, ESG is a bit of a gray area. And that's why there are still, you know, greenwashing out there. I think we, we have to, to face it. One of the reasons is that uh, we are still expecting a, a bunch of regulation, you know, taxonomy, but also many uh, other financial and non-financial KPI that will come that will probably create uh, more uh, bureaucracy and so on. But at the end, my personal view is that we need indeed regulation to provide transparency and to be able to measure and quantify the cost to, to uh, net zero because there are still many actors that uh, you know consider 2050 is far away, so we still have time. And as far as the alignment with our long-term resilience, it's very simple. When you talk to banks today, they tell you in a few years, not 10 years, in a few years from now, all loans will be green. So basically, if you want to survive, not even grow, you have to go in this direction. You have absolutely no choice. And you know, within Carfinimo, uh, we have in-house, fully dedicated team, both project and ESG, working full time on this. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And that's we're at time now. I really want to thank uh, Brenna for her presentation this, more, um, this afternoon. Manuel, Jerome and Jean-Pierre, thank you so much for your contribution to the panel. It's been fantastic to really dive into kind of how institutional investment kind of works within real estate. If you want to find out more, please do go to the EPRA and INREV um, websites. And I hope you enjoy all the other events this week, part of your retirement week. Thank you so much for your time this morning and hope this afternoon. Hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.